as part of our Smithsonian Associates Art of Living series. Our guest today on the Not Old Better Show is astronaut and author Mike Massimino. Earlier, I reviewed Mike's excellent book, Spaceman, an astronaut's unlikely journey to unlock the secrets of the universe, which was featured on the show recently. Today's interview is a companion to that, so please check it out too. Today we had a chance to catch up with Mike on his book tour while in Los Angeles, and Mike tells us in his words about the book, but more importantly, we learn about him as astronaut, someone who survives, perseveres, and thrives with great lessons for all of us, all ages, and especially those of the Not Old Better show. Please join me today in welcoming Mike Massimino. Well, we are with Mike Massimino. Mike is a former NASA astronaut and the author of a new book, a memoir entitled Spaceman, An Astronaut's Unlikely Journey to Unlock the Secrets of the Universe. Mike Massimino, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks very much, Paul. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. Well, it's a pleasure to catch up to you. I, of course, um, uh, was at the Smithsonian Associates lecture when you were present. You talked about the book. It was really great to hear everything that you had to say. I've read the book. I loved it. And I, and I want to know, I, I, uh, I know we, we got a lot of answers that night, but, but, but tell our audience, uh, are, are we any closer to unlocking the secrets of the universe? Are we there yet? <laughs> <laughs> well, we keep getting closer and closer, and sometimes the closer we get, the farther away we seem to be. Um, for example, Hubble, the Hubble Space Telescope, well, both of my missions were to, uh, to um, uh, repair, I went on servicing missions, repair and replace instruments on the, uh, on the Hubble Space Telescope. And most recently, I uh, discovered just last week, it came out that there are 10 times as many galaxies in the universe than we thought. So after all these years of studying the heavens, 25 years of Hubble, we think we have got to start to get a handle on things, and now we discover that, oh, actually, you're only seeing 10% of all these galaxies that are out there. And so it's kind of staggering. The more we, the more we find out, the more we find out that we don't know as much as we think, actually. But uh, we're getting closer. Okay. The, the, th- the other thing that I thought was really fascinating recently, and this was a direct result of, of Hubble's work, of your work and, and the team's work and uh, all that Hubble has brought forward, and that was the, the discovery of water on Europa. And, and I, I just think that, that brings about, it's not just necessarily the discovery of water there. It's that we don't necessarily have to drill through miles of ice to get at it once we get up there. And that, that's a really significant discovery, right? Yeah, that's huge. Uh, you know, Europa, I think, has been one of those places where people have hypothesized that possibly we could, uh, we could live there or we could maybe find some sort of life there. Um, and uh, you know, what we need for our life and to recognize life as we know it is water. And so the, the, the discovery of water in our solar system is, is huge. Um, and it was discovered by Hubble, and it was discovered by an instrument that we repaired on, on Hubble that was broken, and we had to open it up, take it apart, and, and put a new power supply in. And so we're very gratified um, that, that that repair worked and that Hubble's back up and working. That instrument was able to discover that water on on Europa, but yeah, this could be very, very significant. I mean, we still can't get there um, very easily. It would take many, many years for us to get a spacecraft there, but hopefully propulsion technology will will get better, and maybe we can get there in a, in a reasonable amount of time in the future. Yeah, and, and that's talked about in the book a fair bit. Another point that it came out in the book that, that I was struck by, certainly it jumped out at me as someone who's who's worked for the federal government and 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 that was your own uh, you know kind of notion of service of public service your father was a a public servant you watched early on how his contribution to the betterment of the world mattered you went through undergrad uh, got a master's degree a phd you know all of this pointed towards um Maybe not space travel, but certainly public service is an important component to you. Yeah, you know, that's interesting you mentioned that, Paul, because I wasn't really sure that was going to be a, a theme, and it kind of developed when we started writing the, the book that, uh, that you know, the, the notion of doing public service was, uh, was a theme in the book, and it, actually, it is, and it's been a theme in my life, and I don't really ever realize it because 
I didn't see it as doing a service, really. I thought it was more something that I just enjoyed doing. And then looking back at it, yeah, I mean, even when I took my first job at IBM, I worked in the public sector branch office. That was my choice to do that because you're working with nonprofits and hospitals. And, and uh, NASA actually is one of the, one of the um, customers and, and the government and the United Nations and New York City was very interesting work people to work with and I just felt you know that it was important to do something that was socially useful and I'm not really sure how that developed I think you're right I think it's um, out of uh, my father who was an inspector for the New York City Fire Department and being around people like that in my neighborhood there was a lot of uh, police officers and firemen um, you know the people who work for sanitation workers people that work for the local and state governments and uh, you just had the sense of, uh, of, of you know, serving the public good, doing something that was good. And, and you don't have to work for the government to do that. You, know, you can do that in many different ways, uh, whether you're, you know, a teacher or even an entrepreneur or a shopkeeper. I mean, there's all ways to contribute. And I think that that's the important thing. For me, it was, it was I ended up working with, being an astronaut working for the government, and now I'm at a university. But, but I think there was always that sense of that, of, of you know, living a life that makes the world a better place and how important that is. And, um and I, 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 you know, that was something I think that was that I learned at an early age, and certainly comes out in the book. And I didn't expect it to, but it, but it does. Yeah, I, I noticed it right off the bat. I guess the other thing I noticed too about you was this tremendous curiosity that you have, this love of all things science and space. But the curiosity component, I think, is an important one. I think it's important to kind of maintain that all through life. And it seems like that's almost a neglected part of the job description that as astronaut, you, you, you really need to be just kind of curious of everything around you. Yeah, it's, it's true. I think that, uh, you know, they're, 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 the, uh, I think that most astronauts have that in common. Um, some are a little more, um, I guess, directed, straightforward, not thinking about the bigger picture. But most of us, I think, at some, all of us, I think, at some level have that. And I think curiosity is an important thing. Um, to want to know what's what's around the corner, I, I think that's really what our job is about. Um, I think that's what the space program is about: is, is trying to to find out answers to questions that uh, that we don't uh, we're still contemplating. Things like you know, is, is there a life out there? Are we alone? Um, where did we come from? Uh, how did we get here? Uh, these are questions we don't have answers to, um, and we're, we're searching for those. And I think that these are, these answers are these questions are so big that we need to explore outside of our, our, our Earth, our own little world, to find those answers. And um, that's, what, that's what the space program is all about. And as an astronaut, I think that's kind of at the core of it, is that that's what you're doing. You're, you're, you're putting your life on the line to try to answer those questions, to try to find out what's out there, increase our understanding and our knowledge. And there's a lot of other benefits that come from that. You know, we're, we're, the technology that's developed helps the economy. It's inspiring young people to go into to science careers and to, to get an education. It's great for international cooperation, as most of our space projects are international, and I think we'll even be more so in the future. But at the basic core of it, it's trying to understand what is out there and answering those questions, looking into space for those answers. Yeah, and, and the astronaut club is, is, a, is a tiny one, and, and you talk about that in the book, too. In particular, you talk about kind of an astronaut reunion that's going on your first week of new astronaut training, and I, I thought it was a funny yeah. reference. You you call it the 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 Ask Can I think group. Is that, is that about right? Yeah, we were the yeah. When you first get hired, what you when you what you're doing when you apply to be an astronaut, you're not really applying to the astronaut program. You're applying to the astronaut candidate program. It's a very subtle difference. So you're only a candidate. You're an Ask Can when you when you get selected, and then you graduate after about two years of basic astronaut training. You graduate to become a full-fledged astronaut, uh, but when you first arrive, you're an ass can, and so <laughs> and you're called the ass cans until you graduate, and then you're you know another another bunch of astronauts eligible to fly in space. But until you get that training done, you're all ass cans. Well, again, we're with Mike Massimino, author of Spaceman: An Astronaut's Unlikely Journey to Unlock the Secrets of the Universe. Mike, as I read through the book again, I loved it. You you see these names, you know, Buzz Aldrin. Uh, Neil Armstrong, Megan MacArthur, John Glenn, Michael Collins, Sally Ride, Krista McAuliffe, and and your name, and and all of these others of uh, you know kind of different um, backgrounds: scientists, thinkers, researchers. Uh, you know, different. You know, we've got we've got. Uh, I think I've read fifty percent of the most recent class of astronauts is is now um, uh, female. It's it's very divided equally. 
are the doors to becoming an astronaut still open? Are they more open now? What What's kind of the future for the program? Well, I think there's always going to be the classic NASA astronaut, at least for a while. You know, it's kind of like we have military pilots uh, and we also have uh, civilian pilots, and they're both pilots, but with different type of jobs. And I think that right now we have primarily astronauts who fly in space or government people, people that represent uh, the United States or Russia or countries of Europe, Canada, Japan, you name it. Um, there's an astronaut representing a country. I think what we're going to see is more more opportunities in the private sector for people to fly in space, either as tourists or as crew members on spaceships that are taking tourist places or people who want to do research in space as private citizens, not necessarily as uh, as working for the government like we currently have now. So I think that, that it's going to become more of a mix. There's going to be more opportunities uh, for people to fly other than just flying for NASA. But as far as the classic NASA astronaut job, it is still there. They, they're going through a selection process right now. They had about, a, I think they, they had a record. I think the, the last time they selected astronauts four years ago, they had about six to 7,000 applications come in. When I was applying, it was between five and 6,000, I think, somewhere around there. This past, this past selection, most recent selection, had 18,000 applications come in. Um, the, the numbers of the people that they need and the frequency of those selections in the last decade or so has gone down because of the shuttle program going away. But it's been steady, and it's going to increase, I think, in the future once we get more spaceships launching from the United States, which should happen within the next two years or so. There are already crews picked out to do that, to launch on a SpaceX or a Boeing uh, spaceship all, kind of a joint project with NASA to get astronauts to the space station uh, launching from the U.S. Currently, the only way to get there is from Russia. So um, what, what I'm saying is is that, yes, NASA is still looking for astronauts. They will continue to look for astronauts, I think, every few years for the foreseeable future. But I think what's also exciting is there is other ways maybe to get into the space game and actually fly through these private companies that are starting to uh, starting to get very, real close to launching people into space themselves. Well, take us out to space real quickly, certainly at, at kind of the Hubble's level at about 350 miles up. And there's a quote from you, and I, I just want to read this real quickly and, and then just give you kind of my reaction and then, and then get yours. You, you say the, the Earth from our um, altitude at Hubble, we're 350 miles up, we can see the curvature, we can see the roundness of our home, our home planet, and it's the most magnificent thing I've ever seen. It's like looking into heaven, it's paradise. And this is not something I'm supposed to see. This is a secret. I just thought that was that was really moving. Honestly, you know, to have that kind of engineering right brain, left brain kind of uh, notion and, and thought for somebody that has gone through a program, a NASA's program, which it, it seems from the reading about it I've done, it, it's very uh, precision order, almost uh, military-like. You you almost decouple from some of the the dangerous aspects from the, kind of the the maybe the drama. But but here this this quote is this majesty of of the space. Do you recall almost your first glimpse of the of the Earth and your emotions and how it made it how it made you feel then? Of course, yes, it was. Uh... My first glimpse of the Earth came in, from inside the spacecraft, uh, inside the shuttle, as soon as the engines cut and floated up out of my seat and you know, undid my harness and went up there um, uh, to the window, the overhead windows of the space shuttle and looked down uh, on, onto the Earth. We were over the Indian Ocean, just into space for about 10 minutes at that point. Just for, since our launch, it had been 10 minutes early that we launched into space about, um, and uh, had a chance to go up there and take a look down and see how beautiful it was. Um, so I certainly remember that, that beautiful view of the ocean, over the Indian Ocean. Um, what you're referring to, I think, came well, was from, from a passage in a book. I, I have several passages where I describe what I saw from the spacewalks. And now you're not mm -hmm. looking through the window. You're looking through your visor, and you can turn your head and look in any direction. You can turn your body and get a position of anything. You're not restricted by where the window is. And that's out there. That's when I really felt the magnificence of where I was, of being being there with the earth in front of me and seeing its its roundness and then being able to turn my head and see the stars and the moon if it was out and, and everything else around me in the universe and being kind of in between there, between the two looking, was just incredible. And you mentioned the 
you know, the emotions of it. I think that probably on a, you know, on the scale of astronauts being able to, to, um, to want to communicate what they saw in those terms, in emotional terms, I'm probably on the scale of, you know, in the, my, in, you know, I, I really like doing that. I think, you know, yeah, the job takes a lot of precision. And I don't know if it's right brain or left brain, but if whatever side of the brain that deals with precision and engineering, that's definitely a requirement for the job. But there, you know, there are also, I think, some of us that are inclined to want to try to explain what we see. And uh, Alan Bean, for example, is a man who walked on the moon and, and sells paintings. He's a, he's a commercial artist. I think for me, the way I saw my way to do it was to, to tell people about it. I love telling the stories. I was the first one to tweet from space. <laughs> um, and this book was a way for me, Paul, to, re- to release a lot of those emotions and those stories that I wanted to share them with people. And that's what the book has given me. Um, the opportunity to, to do is to is to share those experiences, and it's gratifying to me that you hear you say that it's almost poetic. I guess I'm not a poet, mm-hmm. but I felt like that's what I I needed to be to try to. How can I find this? How can I find the words to 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 explain this to my family and friends and to the world that this is such a wonderful experience? And so what I what I did is is I try to with, explain my emotions of of what I was feeling at the time when I saw the, the planet, and it really is like looking into heaven. It is like a, a holy sight, something that is more beautiful than human eyes can stand to look at. And it's a beautiful home we have. And my relationship with the Earth changed during my first spacewalk when I had a chance to see it. It changed almost uh, because, I, again, I, I've heard you speak a little bit about this. You, you really came to embrace it more. You, you think about the Bruce McCandless photo when he's... It just yeah. kind of all alone up there, and yeah. um, but it's still it's a beautiful picture, and it, it's almost yeah. I, I really took that as being a very poetic statement of yours, and and you embrace the earth in from that same almost that same perspective that of symmetry, and that it, it's really something we need to cherish and uh, and 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 be a part of part of wherever we are, but be really be immersed in. It. Yeah, absolutely, and that's the feeling I got. Yeah, that. That McCandless photo, what you're referring to, when he's in the man maneuvering unit with the Earth in the background, he's away from the shuttle flying that thing. Untethered, by the way. Uh, so he, he was under direct control to make himself a permanent satellite to the space program. But he was a cool cucumber. And um, I remember asking him about that. What was that like? They would never let us do anything like that uh, anymore. We're able to. The reason they had that is so you could get close to satellites and grab them. And, if you couldn't get the shuttle close enough. But what they, we found we could control the, the skill of the pilots and, and of the machine, the, the accuracy of the machine. We could get close to satellites and just grab them. Didn't need to fly a guy out there on his own. But when he was flying out there on his own, I was, that was pretty cool. And I've asked him about that. And, you know, he said the one thing he noticed is that he got really cold. <laughs> what is his own <laughs> comment on that? That he got really cold being that far away from the shuttle. And But other than that, he was, you know, he was, he was fine. Everything went well. I don't know how I would react to something like that, but that's, that was quite a, quite an experience. Well, you, you're, you, you state, you're very open and candid about that. I mean, you're not real wild about heights, right? No, I hate heights. I don't like them at all. I say, I don't even like looking out the side of it. Even in like, you know, I'm really glad that now in hotel rooms, um, you can't open the window. So I don't have to worry about sticking my head out or falling out of the things. So I like that. And I don't even like looking over the edge of a building. Um, I I just don't like it. I don't like heights. I'm not, you know, I'm not a thrill seeker. I I don't, I, I will never parachute unless the airplane is on fire and I have a, and I have a parachute, uh, needed to save my life. Um, but I, you know, I, I'm not a thrill seeker at all. Um, and, um, you know, but, but being an astronaut was different. And luckily it did not invoke my fear of heights. Flying in a, in an airplane nor flying in space did not panic me into the, my fear of heights at all. So I was very grateful for that. But yes, I do not like heights. <laughs> well, the, the book is wonderful, of course. I think there's, there's a couple of lessons, certainly, for, for all of us. And, and I was struck by this, uh, this notion of, of perseverance by you, that you pursued a dream. You, you pursued this several times with NASA. Um, you picked yourself up. You know, you didn't necessarily worry about uh, a bunch of appearances. You started over. You knew that being rejected for eyesight was a um, going to be a challenge, but you were going to overcome it. You were just going to train yourself to kind of uh, deal with some of these things in your your candidacy. And there were there were people in your life who helped you too. That yes, you were able to make you were over, able to overcome some of this stuff, but it was really because of some of the people and their support. Yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. Um, I think throughout my life, and what you find in the book, and what I think is very important is our, our personal relationships. And those relationships come in, um, in in different different forms and at different 
times in my life. You know, at first, as a young person, it was, you know, the teachers that helped me in high school. And then in college, it was, it was a mentor that I met when I was, um, when I was working, a man by the name of Jim McDonald, who I met my, after an internship. Uh, I was working an internship after my junior year at Columbia. And TAs at Columbia, teaching assistants at Columbia, some of my friends that helped me. And then later on in grad school, it was my, my lab mates, uh, some of my lab mates who helped me after I failed my qualifying exam. Um, and then as an astronaut, it was my astronaut colleagues and some of the instructors uh, that helped me overcome some things that weren't going well. And, and getting into the astronaut program with, with my eyesight, it was some very, very dedicated eye doctors, some optometrists who helped me. Uh, see better <laughs> we, under the regulations that NASA had. They didn't accept LASIK or these other procedures. I just had to learn to see the eye chart better through a, through vision training, and, and was able to get over that. and And I think on the on the other hand, you know, trying to turn back around and help people. You know, not, I, what I found is these these people came into my life to help me from time to time when I when I needed help. But I was also willing to take that help. And I think sometimes that's even harder. Mm -hmm. But for me, when I was at a situation where I needed help, I, I, there were people there ready to help who came into my life. And I, and I try to do my best at doing that for others you know, through my job um, at Columbia as a professor and at the Intrepid Sierra and Space Museum. I come into contact with a lot of young people. And, and, and also with my job at Columbia, it gives me the opportunity to speak to a lot of young people at high schools around the country and sharing my story with them. And then when I do, uh, at, on occasion, have an opportunity to help a young person directly, usually a student at Columbia, I, I try to do my best at doing that. Yeah, it's very valuable. And um, certainly the the work, uh, your book, um, all of that's very valuable. I found you on online many, many places, including Columbia University and your Star Talk Radio with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Um, but maybe you can tell us um, what's in store for you on the Big Bang Theory. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm going here. I'm going to the Big Bang Theory has been, uh, you know, it was one of these things I kind of stepped into. Um, didn't really know much about the show when I first was contacted uh, through NASA. They contacted NASA. They wanted to speak to an astronaut, and I was lucky enough to be the astronaut NASA pick to do that. Um, and I think part of it is because what we talked about earlier that I, I enjoy talking about my experience of flying in space and I'm not going to hold back and, uh, I'll, I'll usually tell it in a very positive fashion, but, but very truthfully and, and heartfelt, I think is what I try to do. And anyway, I got the assignment to speak to, uh, to speak to these, uh, writers and producers at the, at the show about my experiences. And after doing that, um, giving them some help on a script through, uh, you know, through my NASA job, they, they reached out again and said, would you like to come in for a cameo? And I was like, sure, that sounds like fun. So luckily I didn't have to go through any auditions or anything like that. They just wrote the part for me, and I went in there and did it. And then that led to five more appearances on the show. I'm going by to see I'm in L.A. right now talking to you, and uh, I'm going there this afternoon for a visit uh, to, to visit with the cast and the crew and the producers and writers. I'm really looking forward to it. It's become like another family for me. You know, I have my own family, and then I have – my NASA family, and I also have the Big Bang Theory family. So I'm looking forward to, to seeing all of them today. Well, we will look forward to seeing you on the Big Bang Theory in the future. We're going to... Um, I hope. Yes, absolutely. I so, hope so. I hope they so have you talk back. it up. Yep, yep. I, yep. I hope they do too. And uh, plenty of your fans will, will want the same. But, but thank you so much for your time today, Mike. It's been a pleasure. Enjoy California and uh, come home safely. <laughs> and uh, please keep us posted as to how you're doing. And we certainly are going to share the great work from uh, your book, again, Spaceman and Astronaut's Unlikely Journey to Unlock the Secrets of the Universe. It's out now. And Mike, thank you so much for being our guest today. Paul, thank you. And to all your listeners, thanks for listening and uh, hanging in there for the whole interview. And, and, uh, and I hope everyone that gets the book, gets their hands on it, enjoys it. Um, I, I wrote it to share my experiences and and so far, it seems like people are enjoying it. Like your very kind words, I appreciate. And, and uh, thanks so much for your time. Thanks again, Mike. We're going to share it widely. All right, Paul. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye-bye. Right, thanks to all my guests today, all the help on the podcast, and especially to Media Studio Edit and the great work by Wayne Brown and his team for editing the podcast and making me sound so much better. That is to say... Not old, but better. Thanks to all. Um.